joining us today on VLGA Connect. I'm very pleased to welcome Jason Clare, who is the Shadow Minister for Regional Services, Territories and Local Government, as well as Shadow Minister for Housing and Homelessness. Jason, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Lovely to speak with you. I'm really keen just to get your thoughts and observations on particularly uh, how the local government sector is responding to COVID-19 and, and what you're observing. Yeah, we, we often focus on um, the businesses in our local community and how hard they've been hit by the virus and what's happened in the last few months and necessarily so. You know, businesses mm. being small have been smashed. Um, but local governments come under extraordinary pressure in the last few months. Um, local governments had to shut down a lot of the services that it provides to the local community, everything from swimming pools to libraries, community centres. Some, some councils run airports. Um, it meant that a lot of councils are hemorrhaging. Uh, they, they, you know, their budgets are coming under enormous strain. But in the midst of all of that, um, I've seen some extraordinary things from councils providing you know, the, the sort of local leadership that you would want and expect uh, from your local council, whether that helping out local businesses by waiving fees or residents waiving rates or um, an example in my local area where the council's um, agreed not to you know, basically provide free parking for nurses and hospital workers around the local hospital because more nurses are driving to work, um, needing to be able to get uh, get to work safely, avoid um, all of the, you know, I guess all of the risks and challenges of using public transport, at least at the height of the, uh, the epidemic, the virus. And um, that's where, you know, council stepped in and done something very practical. And that's the sort of leadership I'm talking about that makes a difference. Some councils have gone so far as to uh, freeze some of their income sources, such as parking revenue, even more broadly yeah. than the example that you've provided. Um, rate deferrals, freezes, et cetera, recasting budgets, um, so that there's, in some cases, no rate increases. How concerned are you about what this says about the longer term financial sustainability of the sector? Well, it, it, it was already a challenge. It puts councils and their budgets under even more pressure. Uh, you know, one of the great fears uh, a couple of months ago was that there'd be wholesale sackings or standing down of council workers across the country. And we did see some examples of that in mm. Victoria, also in New South Wales and WA and a few other places. But by and large, what councils have done is try to keep people on, um, get people who might have been working in one part of the, the council to come and work somewhere else. But that comes with a cost. Uh, if you're not getting the revenue in, and this has been a, a particular problem for metropolitan councils who supplement their budgets with the revenues they get from the type of services they've had to shut, then budgets get smashed. I think that problem we're going to see continue in the months ahead because even though some of these services can reopen, as you rightly point out, if you've had to waive fees or waive rates for some people, then it has an impact on the budget. In, in my area, you know, I met with the mayor yesterday and he said look this is this has cut a 20 million dollar hole in in the the budget of the of canterbury bankstown council where i where i live mm. um mm. he showed me a list of all of the footpath projects all of the playground projects all of the road projects that um that were going to happen in the in the next 12 months that have just been pushed pushed off because they can't afford to do it now and that's not that's not unique to my local council i'm sure that's the case across Victoria and across the country. It is. It's replicated many times over. Uh, that, that issue that you raise about some councils being forced to make some tough decisions about staff, do you, do you think that would have happened if the JobKeeper program had included council workers as, um, as being um, um, meeting the criteria? Well, it would have made it easier. Um, you know, I, I made the point in Parliament that there's no difference between a, a swimming pool instructor at a council pool and a swimming pool instructor at a private pool. Mm. They're both mm. the same sort of job, uh, but yeah. they're treated differently under this scheme. One gets the job keeper wage subsidy and the other doesn't. Uh, if that money was made available to councils to help support those, those people, you know, at least those people working in a council who, whose, whose job was affected by the shutdown people who worked in the library but couldn't work there because it was closed, who worked in the community centre but couldn't, 
couldn't work there because it was shut. Who worked at the swimming pool that couldn't work there because it had been shut. And that, that funding would have helped those councils to, to, to get through this without having that, that big debt or, or that big hole in their budget yeah. at the end of all of this. And um, to, you know, we got the news last week that the government massively misforecast the cost of this scheme. Remember, the forecast was the reason they said they couldn't apply this to council workers. And now we find out the forecast was wrong. Uh, mm. So that, you know, I guess that rubs salt into the wound for a lot of people who work in local government who think, look, we could have had access to this. Mm. Uh, but didn't. Indeed. Look, a bit of a left field question. Uh, one, part of the argument, as I understood it from the Commonwealth, was that council workers came under state government responsibility. And for some years, there's been debate about whether the third level of government should be recognised in the federal constitution. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think this is an argument for revisiting that view that councils should be uh, recognised at that higher level constitutionally? Well, it's always been my view. And um, Albo, when he was the minister for local government, led the charge there as well. The Labor Party stands ready to amend the constitution or to... Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't say amend the constitution, but but put it to a referendum. <laughs> put it to a referendum, yes, of course. Yeah. The local government should be recognised in the constitution. There's a bunch of things that um, I think a lot of Australians would like to change about the constitution, recognising Indigenous people uh, uh, properly for a start. Um, so there, there, there's a there's a bit of a, a logjam of of ideas that are, that people have about what they'd like to put to a referendum, but this is one of them. Yeah. Um, and, and in the context of this debate, I said, you, you can't just shove this off to state government and say that it's all your responsibility. You know, federal government provides funds to local government as well. The, you know, the financial assistance grants are the best example of that. So to say that local government is the responsibility of state government is just, is just factually wrong. Uh, it's it's the responsibility of federal and state government to work together to to help local government. That's what I said should have happened here. It, it didn't. Um, when it suits the federal government, they shovel money at local government. And we saw a little bit of a, an example of that last week with the money for roads um, and uh, uh, to assist in stimulus and recovery. That's smart. We support that because local government um, is a key to getting the economy open, up and running again, creating local jobs, getting the community uh, back to what we were. Um, but think about it, you know, I mentioned my council has had a $20 million hole cut in it because of the crisis. Uh, it got $1.6 in funding last week from the federal government. So it's a, <clears throat> yeah. a bite-sized chunk out of a, a massive shark bite into its budget. And I'd urge the, the, the federal government, you know, to, to think a little bit more about what more they can do in terms of providing support to local government, to support local communities get back on their feet. We, we did this during the global financial crisis uh, and we're, we were able to build important infrastructure around the country hand in hand with local government. And we can do it again. So I noticed that you were encouraged, was the word I think you used about that, that announcement last week. A, a bulk of the money that was announced was, of course, the federal assistance grants coming forward, as has happened for about eight of the last 10 years, as, yeah. as I recall. Um, the, um, the fact is, as you've said, 537 councils, 500 million is not going to go a long way. So what else needs to be done and, and quickly, in your view? It would, have been, it would have been surprising if they didn't bring the financial assistance grants forward, or at least half of it. So you're right. Um, mm -hmm. That was what councils wanted, expected, and had budgeted for. So that's a good thing. And mm -hmm. um, I wasn't surprised by it, but um, I was glad to see it. Lots of councils need that money and they need that certainty. So, so that's good. The extra money uh, is welcome as well. But as you rightly point out, on average, they got a bit, bit over 500 councils around the country 500 million, about a million dollars is, is, is helpful, but it's modest. It's uh, not going to go that far, <clears throat> really. No, no, no. It's going to deliver some good projects that uh, might not have been able to be done in the, last, in the next 12 months, but mm. you know, it's, a, it's a small contribution towards what I think is needed. Uh, I think the government realises now that unemployment is going to get higher in the next six months, not lower. The projections are that it'll sort of reach around about 10%. It's about 6% on official figures at the moment. So that tells you that things are going to get worse. When that JobKeeper program 
ends, which is expected to end in September, the government might change that, but when that ends in September and, and when the Job Seeker program uh, ends in September and people go back to the ordinary rate of $40 a day, you're going to see a lot more people uh, struggling uh, to survive. If you've got high unemployment, more people, you know, one and a half million people potentially surviving on $40 a day, then communities are going to struggle more at the end of this year than they are now. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the challenge for the federal government and state governments is, okay, well, how do we get our economy back up and going without the virus taking off again? Uh, and history tells us, just go back to the stimulus projects for the GFC, that if you, if you provide support to local governments um, for targeted infrastructure projects, then you can create lots of local jobs and you can build things that the community needs. Um, in my local area, uh, you know, I remember I was an MP uh, back then, sort of a few less gray hairs than I have now, um, but uh, we had a commuter car park built at the local railway station. Um, we had uh, an art centre built. We had an indoor sports centre built. Uh, I can tell you what, it's not wasted money. Uh, that yeah. car park is always full. That art centre is always full. Yes. Uh, kids, right. as well as the first grade cricket team, use that, that cricket centre. Um, so they're the sorts of things that governments, if, if they work with local government, can do. They can create more jobs, get that unemployment rate down, get more people back with a wage in their pocket rather than surviving on $40 a day and, and build the sort of infrastructure that we need. Indeed, looking forward to lots of those uh, stimulus projects. Before I let you go, Jason, you also have the portfolio of housing and homelessness. How, how do you, um, I guess, summarise the impact of COVID-19 on what's already a, a really challenging problem? Well, I guess it's two parts, housing and homelessness. So mm -hmm. in, in the housing sector, people have stopped uh, buying new homes. Mm -hmm. Not surprising if, if you'd lost your job or if you, even if you watch the news and you see what's happening around the world, then it sucks the confidence out of uh, anybody thinking about getting a loan for half a million dollars to buy a new home. And so what it's meant is that instead of about 160,000 homes, new homes being built every year, the, the housing industry thinks that there'll probably only be about 100,000 homes built this year. Um, local government will see this in the number of DAs and what's happening uh, particularly for councils that are in those, uh, you know, on the fringes of our major cities where a lot of that urban development is happening. Yes. Um, the, the, the first effect we'll see of that is the people who build the homes being on the dole queue, uh, tradies, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, etc., not having enough work to keep going. A lot of, you know, these are often um, mum, dad, and a youth, small businesses that are under threat here, but it's also the, the manufacturers of everything from the plasterboard to the timber and um, the tiles and so forth. It's a big industry that employs about a million people. So what I've been calling for for a couple of weeks now is for the government to, to invest some money in keeping the housing construction industry going, turn around that drop from 160,000 predicted homes down to 100. And that'll, that'll, that, that's really important, I think, in terms of making sure that we don't have that unemployment rate go even higher than it already is. So that's the, that's, that's the big thing in housing. Housing generally, you know, I think um, the last few months have shown us just how important having a safe house uh, and affordable home is. Mm. Uh, we're all told to, to stay in them. Most of us can't wait to get out of them. Um, true. Um, but for people who didn't have them, they were found a home as well. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people sleeping rough were provided with accommodation in some of those empty hotels. And, and you know, that shows us at a time when we've got more people who are homeless than ever before, according to the latest census, you know, that if we're serious about it, if we care enough about it, then we can do significant things to cut the number of people that are sleeping rough in our, in our cities and in our suburbs, uh, and do more to provide affordable accommodation for, for people who need it. So. One of the things I've, I've been calling for as part of keeping tradies working is building more affordable rental accommodation in our cities for frontline workers. Mm. People like nurses, ambulance officers, cleaners, bus drivers, the sort of people that uh, 
didn't get to work from home for the last few months, but had to put their own safety on the line. Often they live on the fringes of our big cities where it's a little bit cheaper to live, but their jobs are often in the CBD or in the wealthier, more expensive parts of town. Yeah. Um, it, you see examples of this overseas. It, it's, it's a smart investment by a government to try to make sure that we've got more affordable rental accommodation for frontline workers close to where they work. And there's some good examples of this in Sydney and in Melbourne. I think at Mooney Ponds, First State Super's got uh, an investment there with a, with a local housing company. But, um, you know, they're bite-sized. They're small projects at the moment. And so, so maybe, you know, take out from here would be, I'd encourage local government. I know that local government's already invested in this and thinking about it. I've, I've met with councils who do this around the country. But local government super funds and government working together to provide more affordable accommodation, particularly for the sort of people who are the, who are the heroes of this crisis, frontline workers, would build better cities uh, and um, you know, make for uh, better lives for the sorts of people that yep. we've found out in the last few months we really need and depend upon. It's probably a, a longer conversation for another day. Local government, I think, is is ready to, to do whatever it can to uh, solve this ha affordable and social housing problem. There's just so many pieces of the puzzle that need to fall into place, as you know. We're going to have to leave it there, Jason. I uh, really appreciate you coming on the program and talking to us today about all of those uh, local government uh, matters in a world of COVID-19 and we wish you all the very best. Thank you. Uh, it's been great to have a chat and uh, look forward to having a chat at another time. We've been speaking with the Honourable Jason Clare, MP, the member for Blacksland, but the uh, Federal Shadow Minister for uh, Local Government and a number of other portfolios as, uh, as we discussed. If you have suggestions for future episodes of the LGA Connect, or perhaps a story that's happening in your part of the world you'd like to share with the world, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email to vlga at vlga.org.au. And I look forward to having your company again soon on another edition of VLGA Connect.